Hello and welcome all to the global launch of a toolkit which, if we use it as its creators intend, will bring positive change for millions of children around the world. Indeed, our hope is that the interagency toolkit preventing and responding to child labour in humanitarian action will transform the lives of some of the 152 million girls and boys whose lives are being blighted by child labour. I'm Chris Gunnis, your moderator for the next hour and a half, which will be high energy and hands on. We encourage all attendees to use the chat to share their comments and experiences from the countries they work in and to use the Q&A function to ask questions that will be addressed in writing or during the Q&A section later in the event. The other thing you can do is to use Zoom reactions by clicking on emojis to provide nonverbal feedback. Our hosts, the Alliance for Child Protection for Humanitarian Action, Plan International and the International Labour Organization have given us three clear objectives for this launch. One, to understand the scale of the problem and outline ways to spread information on holistic approaches to dealing with it. Two, to build understanding, particularly on ways that countries can prevent and respond to child labor. Three, to engage stakeholders and energize them to take measurable action to end child labor. And by the way, one thing we can all start doing right now is to join the global conversation and to share key messages and takeaways on your social media channels using the hashtag, hashtag EndChildLabor2021. And so to our opening addresses. Despite the scale of the challenge globally, there are some signs of hope. The Convention on the Worst Forms of Child Labour was universally ratified last year. And this year, the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labour, is an opportunity to do just that, to eliminate this scourge altogether. So, on that note of determination and commitment, I give the floor to our first speaker, Audrey Bollier, co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, to lay out the impact of humanitarian crises on child labour and the role of the Alliance. Audrey has almost two decades of humanitarian experience, including almost a decade in the field of child protection in emergencies in various contexts, including Sri Lanka, Iraq, and South Sudan. Before joining the Alliance, Audrey worked on the Syria crisis response in, response in Jordan, and subsequently at regional level as child protection advisor. Audrey, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. First of all, on the behalf of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, I would like to welcome you and thank you all for your participation today to the launch of the Interagency Child Labour Toolkit. It is a great pleasure to see so many of you present at this event. The scale and severity of child labour call for urgent action by humanitarian actors to address the tolls that crises take on children and their families. As stated in the toolkit, humanitarian crises negatively affect child labor in three ways. New child labor risk factors, exacerbation of existing child labor risk factors, change or undermining of a child protective environment. And in addition to that, half of the children in child labor can be found in hazardous work. With the emergence of the COVID-19, we have seen an increase of child protection concerns, including risk for children to be enrolled in child labor as a way to cope with the economic situation. We have a long road ahead of us to overcome the, the impact of the pandemic and to protect children. However, eliminating child labor cannot just be the responsibility of child protection practitioners. This requires a more holistic approach to the situation, bringing over sectors in the response. How can we support a child who is engaged in child labor if the family cannot access cash or livelihood programming, or if the child cannot go back to school or get an alternative option? We have been talking for years about working together with other sectors. And the current pandemic taught us that we need to move away from concept to actually start joining forces to tackle issues affecting children, including child labor. 
This toolkit is a good example of integration and multi-sectoral action. You will find in it practical tools to support these approaches. Collaborating together to address and eliminate child labor is not anymore an option, but it has become a must. But working together means also working more closely with frontline partners, helping to strengthen their response to child labor, bridging the humanitarian development divide. During preparedness and long-term humanitarian responses, it is essential to collaborate with development and long-term actors to advocate for stronger child labor legislation and policy to address these gaps. To be able to effectively address child labor, we need to look at the preventative actions that can be put in place to ensure that the child's environment remains protective. With this toolkit, practitioners will have the opportunity to better be prepared to address child labor at its early stage, looking at the risk and the protective factors. This toolkit can support evidence-informed, timely and effective action for children in humanitarian settings in order to achieve sustainable development goal 8.7 to end all forms of child labor by 2025. The Alliance will continue to support the work of the Child Labor Task Force and work with partners to ensure that we will keep this momentum throughout the year. 2021, being the international year for the elimination of child labor, we are hoping that this toolkit will help field practitioners to continue their work and support the elimination of child labor across the world. Together, we can rise to this challenge. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Audrey, sorry, I'm delighted to say we've got a new member of the Alliance, which is your cat sitting behind you. It's lovely <laughs> to see it. But can I ask you a very quick question? Because we've got a little bit of time. If you had one key message for everybody on this call, everyone listening to this, what would it be for all the participants? One key message. If it was one key messages, I think it's really joining forces, working across sectors all together to address child labor and really looking at from education perspective, uh, cash and livelihood perspective to bring really that holistic response uh, to the children enrolled in child labor. And actually we'll be hearing hopefully from Lebanon on those cross-sectoral approaches later on. Audrey, thank you very much. That was a great start. Thank Before you. I introduce the next speaker, I'd like to say that the next segment in this launch event is a Q&A session. So if any questions occur as you hear our speakers, or if there are any points you want to make, please send them in to the group chat. We go next to Francesca Dovidio, Officer in Charge for Fundamentals and Head of Solutions and Innovations Unit at the International Labour Organization. Francesco has over 20 years of experience with the ILO. This includes the roles of Country Director in Pakistan, Indonesia and Timor-Leste, Chief Technical Advisor on Child Labour Projects in Ghana and Madagascar. He has supported work on other child labour projects in countries such as Colombia, DRC, Rwanda, Burundi, Sri Lanka, the Philippines and Cote d'Ivoire. Francesco, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, uh, I feel even older than uh, what I am <laughs> after your introduction. <laughs> achieving that. And uh, thank you so much for giving uh, me the floor and to the idol through me and uh, I just uh, since you will be asking that question that the key message let me start by that so uh, I will not be taken by surprise uh, sure sure please do <laughs> was uh, I, I the key message is this on humanitarian uh, what uh, Simon and I and thanks to Simon uh, my colleague Simon Hills who have been working hard on all this uh, um, outcome for, for this toolkit uh, we have been working also on humanitarian uh, crisis and which is not uh, you know we don't see the ILO as immediately a partner on that but there are so many aspects that are important uh, to take into account when it comes to labor rights in general on the humanitarian crisis and one of this is the actually the recrudescence of child labor and the fact that uh, a crisis in a country it is obvious that uh, it, it will uh, worsen the number of child labor particularly in, in its worst form and not only for children that are directly uh, imply uh, associated to to the conflicted but or to a natural crisis by in general so 
we sometimes we forget that it's important that we put the preventive aspect as also as Audrey was talking about at the beginning of the humanitarian response. We forget about this sometimes, so it's important we, we do it. That's the key message. Regardless of who is going to do that, it doesn't have to be the ILO, anyone, it doesn't matter. It's important is there in the holistic response that is given to a conflict. That's my key message. Then uh, I just want, I'm, I'm very glad to hear uh, to uh, the Alliance for Children, for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, and particularly the Global Child Labor Task Force that uh, co -chair, is co-chairing together with PLAN. I'm really, really happy that uh, all this very, very strong, solid institution are, uh, you know, joining efforts to, to come out with this, uh, with, to, with this toolkit. Audrey said it all. I mean, this is uh, complicated times uh, for the fight against child labor. We have a, a very ambitious target ahead of us uh, that is SDG are, uh, you know, giving us of the elimination of all worst form of child labor by 2025, which is basically the day after tomorrow. And let's be very clear here, we are in 2021 and we will, we will not reach this target at the, at the current pace of evolution of action that we are taking. We will not reach this target at the current pace of involvement, of commitment that we have from the different partners. We need to do something different. And uh, we have a lot of opportunities here. It, uh, Audrey again reminded the fact that the UN, not the ILO, the UN, for the first time, they declare this year as the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labor. Then we have other things like the fact that the, one of the convention of the ILO, Convention 182 on the worst form of child labor has been unanimously ratified by all the ILO member states. This has never happened before. Uh, it's uh, why it's happening for child labor. Well, there must, there must be a reason. There must be a strong, a real clear commitment from everyone. That is the way to go, that we need to accelerate the action to, to eliminate child labor. But, but the fact is, is that we, the COVID has created another complicated uh, um, situation here because we don't have real numbers yet. We will have it next year on the impact of COVID on child labor, but we know that this might reverse uh, decades of progress on the fight against child labor. We moved from 250 million to 150 million of children uh, involved in child labor in 20 years, more or less. You know, the ILO is taking, you know, coming out with trends every four years. The next one will be this, this in June, we will have the new trends on the presence of child labor in the world. And uh, while progress of 100 million in 20 years is really amazing, it's, it's an outstanding result. But as I said, the COVID, we don't know what, what it has brought to us. We, we are very worried that many families had to go back to use children in the, in the family uh, income to make sure that there is an income at the end of the month. And that is, we are, we are particularly worried about this. But COVID has also created other opportunities. I think, um, and I'm talking about COVID now because it's a crisis. Uh, and this, uh, th this toolkit can also, is also answering to to the current uh, crisis situation that we have uh, in, uh, in different places. And we will have a very important panel later on to discuss this. It has brought opportunity. Countries have put together a solution when it comes to social protection, when it comes to alternative li livelihoods for adults for decent work, when it comes to subsidies for uh, unemployment. These are things that we have been advocating for for years because we really think this is the way to uh, combat child labor in a, in a sustainable way. And countries were not ready to put all this resource, and I'm, I'm talking about countries all over the world, any socioeconomic condition uh, that we might think of. So it is possible when a crisis hit to come out with the necessary resources to overcome it. Why we are not doing it with child labor? Probably because we saw it as a long thing, a long-term, issue that doesn't have to be solved now. We want COVID to finish today or tomorrow, right? We are all, you know, we can't take this anymore for different reasons, but the children cannot wait. So for some reason, children, we have the feeling that they can, they can wait, that they, they can wait 2025 and maybe beyond that. That's not okay. But Francesco, can I just ask you a very, very quick question? Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I hear you say that we need to do something different. I hear you say we're not going to meet the deadline. Um, 
what do you say to people out there? Name and shame for me. T tell, well, what's the ILO doing about this? And, you know, let me just say we've got people from Kenya, from Jordan, from Iraq, Kurdistan, Bangladesh, India, Ethiopia, Egypt, Nicaragua, Myanmar. What do you say to those people about how we can work together to meet the deadline? And what is that different thing that you say we should be doing? Countries have the primary responsibility. That's for sure. They have to ensure that there is the necessary budget is allocated to education, to health, to um, uh, uh, vocational training for adults and to decent work for adults. That's their responsibility. They have to ensure also that the monitoring takes place. We are there with the international community to give the necessary tool. And today we are talking about one of these tools. But we cannot do this without the, the political commitment and the strong uh, uh, yeah, the strong political winter from the country. And, and, and French alone, let me just one second. So one please, second. please, please. They are not alone. The world has changed. We are in a globalized world. We, it, this would be a mistake to think the country can solve it alone. Business also has to play a very important role. There are supply chain where children are involved in different stages. We have to involve the business as well. They have the responsibility. They also can make a difference on this. Okay, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, is there anything more you'd like to add before I move on to our next speaker, Francesco? That was that was a great message about business being involved, about the problems of uh, COVID. You mentioned also resources, and also you mentioned preventative measures. And I think those are all very important points you make. So, Francesco, if you're happy there, I'll move ahead to our next well, speaker. ILO is a tripartite organization. I mentioned government, I mentioned employers. Let me mention the workers as well. That's uh, not the children, but the adults as well. They also have to raise their voice and make sure that they fight for their rights and we are there to uh, to help them uh, to achieve this adult child i mean a decent work for adults means less child labor indeed let us not forget that the ilo is a tripartite organization and others apart from governments have responsibility well before i move to our next speaker allow me to say again that we're using the hashtag end child labor 2021 in support of this year's campaign so please start putting out uh, your, your, your key messages on social media feeds using that hashtag. So to the last of our opening speakers, Anne Birgitta Albertson, CEO of Plan International, a thought leader in development and gender equality. Anne Birgitta has worked for 25 years in international development, human rights, change management and diplomacy. Anne Birgitta will be addressing us via a video message. May we please have that now. Thank you. Child labour deprives children of their childhood, their potential and their dignity. Children living through humanitarian crises are disproportionately affected. In times of crisis, when people are forced to flee their homes, schools close, jobs are lost and the availability of services decreases. Child labour becomes a coping mechanism for many families in distress. We know that child labour is gendered while we see in the data that boys often appear to be at higher risk, we also know that some of the worst forms of child labor, such as trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation, disproportionately impact girls. Girls are particularly vulnerable to exploitation and face greater risks of sexual and gender-based violence. We also know that much of the work that girls do is often invisible and missed in child labour estimates. We know that girls are more likely to work in unregulated domestic work, for example, which is not considered in child labour estimates. Domestic work is often hidden and hard to tackle because of pervasive underlying social and cultural norms that regard domestic work as a traditional female role and responsibility. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the challenge of child labor. Economic downturns and school closures have pushed millions more children, girls and boys into child labor. During the last year, Plan International's needs assessments in Lebanon and Jordan have found not only that more children appear to be working than before the pandemic, but also that they're working under poorer conditions for longer hours and doing extra jobs to make ends meet. More than ever, it's critical that we step up efforts to both prevent and respond to child labour and prevent a rollback of progress already made. Plan International is working in multiple countries to prevent and respond to child labour in humanitarian settings. Our programmes help to tackle child labour in a number of ways. 
Together with partners, we're providing tailored education and psychosocial support for Lebanese and Syrian refugee adolescent girls at risk of child labor. We've developed the Missing Child Alert System across Bangladesh, Nepal, and India, which allows data on missing and identified children to be shared between authorities of the three countries to respond to cross-border child trafficking in South Asia. This was utilized following the 2015 Nepal earthquake when child trafficking risks spiked. In this, the international year for the elimination of child labor, there must be a particular focus on tackling child labor during humanitarian crisis. Pursuing the goal of eliminating child labor in crisis settings demands a different set of approaches to those used outside of crisis. Child protection actors play a very central role, but actors across many other sectors much, must also prioritize the issues if we are to effectively prevent and respond to the problem of child labor in humanitarian crisis. The interagency toolkits we're launching today offers a strong global commitment to addressing child labor in humanitarian action. We are in particular calling on humanitarian actors to take care not to overlook hidden forms of child labor and to apply a strong gender lens to their prevention and respond efforts. On behalf of Plan International, I am proud to be launching the interagency toolkit on preventing and responding to child labor in humanitarian action. Alongside ILO, Plan International has co-led the development of this toolkit with the Global Child Labor Task Force under the Alliance of Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. I want to recognize and thank everybody involved in the development of this rich and practical toolkit, which will be a fantastic asset to the global community's effort to tackle child labor in humanitarian action. Thank you. That was Anne Birgitta Albrechtson. And as I've said, we want to create a global buzz around this launch and the toolkit. So throughout this event, we want you to make as many social media postings as possible. And to point the way, I'd like you to see a quick video giving you some ideas of how to use the hashtag for this event, End Child Labour 2021. During this launch of the Interagency Toolkit on preventing and responding to child labour and humanitarian action, we invite all colleagues to use this hashtag hashtag end child labor 2021 throughout their social media networks during and after the launch to share comments, questions, and new learnings. We also invite you to visit the Alliance Twitter page and the Alliance Facebook page to share and comment on posts regarding the interagency toolkit. And together we can end child labor. Wonderful. So get on to social media. So let's open up the toolkit. What's in it and what are its key messages? I want now to move to a joint presentation by Simon Hills and Silvia Onyate, co-leads of the Child Labour Task Force under the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian mm. Action. Before I go to them, can I please again ask all participants to send questions into the chat room, which I can see is a buzz. We've already had quite a few, so please keep them coming and please keep using that hashtag EndChildLabor2021. So over to Simon and Sylvia, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Chris. So the main purpose of this interagency toolkit is to guide humanitarian actors and other agencies like all the participants that we have today uh, in the launch to take preventative and response action to respond to child labor in humanitarian action. So for instance, to guide uh, analyzing child labor situations or designing strategies or coordinating between different actors and ensuring that humanitarian strategies do not exacerbate child labor risks that we know that sometimes happens. Actually, this toolkit emphasizes the humanitarian approach to address child labor, particularly the worst forms of child labor, but also provides guidance for preparedness and also for the recovery phases, as well as uh, protracted crisis settings. Simon, tell us a bit more about the process in the development of the toolkit. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, the 
The toolkit has been put together over a number of years. I mean, there was previously a tester version which had been launched um, a number of years back. But in the last couple of years, we've been looking to update and ensure that the tools and the examples that are given are relevant and um, meaningful. And we've been doing this in a very participatory process with interagency collaboration and connection. As I said, there was the field testing, um, but we also interviewed and consulted with colleagues in the field um, in HQ and a lot of um, research was done. As you can see, we had 90 humanitarian practitioners from various organizations involved covering around 19 countries. And we really want to thank all who took part in this process. It, it has been a long slog and it has been difficult to achieve, but I think um, the toolkit is much richer because we do have all these different practitioners and examples from all around the world involved in it. Sylvia, if you want to talk a little more about the actual toolkit itself. Yes, uh, so this definitely like global and interagency toolkit is divided in four parts and can be very easily accessed and navigated. Thank you to the interactivity, the icons and the images that you can see throughout the document when you open the toolkit. As you see in the image, uh, there are like four parts in the toolkit. The first part, why act on child labor and humanitarian action? It provides clarity on child labor concepts. For example, child work that doesn't equal child labor and not necessarily to be eliminated, on child labor that is harmful and to be eliminated, on worst forms of child labor to be eliminated as a matter of urgency. And also includes the concepts on the legal framework, like different conventions, and outlines the main risks and consequences of child labor in humanitarian settings. So in this first part, it has several like case studies and tools. One example is the um, child labor guidance that was developed in Cox Bazar for all the humanitarian actors there. And an example of a tool is a, a, a tool that actually helps you identify risks and protective factors at different levels, at child level, family, community, and society. And this is very in line with our new child protection minimum standards. Part two is ensuring a quality response. So what do we need for ensuring a quality child labor response is core elements, coordination, needs assessment, analysis, strategy development, and also resource mobilization, very important. It includes examples on how to coordinate, also includes tools like what we need to know uh, to add to the different assessments, like questions that can be included in the assessments. And it has, for example, an example from Turkey where a child labor technical group was created for coordination. If we go to the part number three, we have the prevention and response program actions. And in that we can see a specific guidance for prevention and response actions uh, for a specific sectors, not only for child protection, also education, food security, livelihoods, health, uh, early childhood development, etc. And some that we want to highlight today, for example, is the um, targeting for food security and livelihoods or the inclusion of cash uh, for children, adolescents at risk. So there are multiple actions included in this part of the toolkit. And finally, the four uh, part of the toolkit is about core implementation actions. So there are also other areas that need to be included and need to be considered when looking at child labor and humanitarian action. And these are communications and advocacy. And we are all today, for example, using the hashtag end child labor 2021, uh, but also on knowledge management and capacity building, monitoring and evaluation and accountability. So some of the very important tools that you can also see in this part of the toolkit are child labor messaging that you can use for advocacy or for awareness raising, or some examples from Northwest Syria where they added a child labor situation monitoring and reporting monitoring. And it's highlighted as an example and a pra very practical example. So I invite you all of you to go through the toolkit and find out more about this rich resource. But Simon, who can specifically use the toolkit? Thanks. We've tried to design the toolkit for, for three different audiences in mind, really. 
Number one, for all actors supporting child labour preparedness and response actions in humanitarian settings. This includes uh, government personnel, NGOs, policy makers, international organisations, community organisations, donors, coordinators, and those working on human resources, resource mobilisation, learning development, advocacy, media or communications. So really a wide range. And then we've got the practitioners on the ground as well, those who are responsible for child labour strategy design, coordinating their programmes, implementing their programmes, not just within child labour, but across child protection, education, food security, livelihoods, health, economic strengthening, and as such, the toolkit includes specific guidance and tools for these um, different sectors to address the issue of child labour. As you can imagine, child labour, while being a protection issue and being very specific, has many overlaps. Obviously, if children are in school, they're less likely to be engaged in child labour. So if they drop out, have they dropped out to engage in work? If, if parents are economically deprived, are the children more likely to be into school, uh, leave school and go into child labour? What can livelihoods do to support the parents better so the children don't engage in work? As you can see, it's an extremely cross-cutting and key area, which, which brings in many different actors who may not have the uh, skills and knowledge to, to fully address straight away. And then finally, particular and relevant um, now is as we've developed this, obviously COVID has happened, but we've had other previous infectious disease outbreaks as well, such as Ebola, um, Zika. And so we've looked from the information we've got from all these previous sort of pandemics and um, health crises as well to see how these have an impact. So we've got experiences collected from Ebola, cholera outbreaks and Zika as well to see what the economic impact is on child labour and how this impacts on the risk factors. Can I, can I just jump in and ask you a very quick question? Um, sure. What about COVID? You heard Francesca warn that COVID may actually stop us meeting the deadlines that we've set ourselves. What does the toolkit say about COVID and working to meet these deadlines under the pandemic? Well, the toolkit itself has been under development for the last, we're in 2021 now, so probably three years. So 2018, 2019 um, was when it was really being finalised. So I mean, COVID came just as we were wrapping up on, on a lot of the information going in. So there may not, we have put stuff in on COVID, but it's not specifically targeted there. However, it doesn't mean that the work on Ebola, everything else isn't relevant. And we're still in the middle of the COVID crisis. We don't necessarily know which direction it's going. Um, aside from this toolkit, the, the Child Labour Task Force has put together an issue paper uh, and a note uh, available on the website specifically dealing with COVID and some of the challenges which may arise. As we've seen in some of the camps in Jordan, COVID has interrupted people's education, which then puts them at risk. And, and as we've said, they're the economic factors there. And obviously with social distancing, curfews, et cetera, there have been many different sort of areas where COVID has also changed the nature of, of child work and, and well, it's changed the, the world of work in general. So obviously that has an impact on, on child labour as well. I want um, to ask a, a very quick question, Sylvia. How easy is this toolkit to use if you're not a child labour specialist? Uh, thank you for this question, Chris. Yeah, it's very easy and we are not expecting for all the users to go through the whole toolkit. And that's why it has a very clear navigation where you can have a specific icons and you can go to the part that you are uh, interested in and you have exclamations for important information, you have tools and you have case studies and you have hyperlinks that can help you guide where is the section that you need to access. So for example, I added on the chat uh, a tool that has a uh, link to the infectious disease outbreaks and highlights specific actions for those that are very interested in working and you know working collaboratively with other sectors. Uh, and similarly to other tools available or case studies. So it's very easy to navigate uh, thanks to the interactivity of the toolkit. I need to move you both along. Show us the microsite because you've created a microsite uh, to go along with the toolkit. So tell us about that. Yes, thank you, Chris. Just before like I show you the microsite, I want to reinforce like three key messages sure. based on we already heard like our speakers, but if there's uh, anything we want like uh, the audience to remember is like these three top key messages that are really reinforced and based on the evidence uh, 
through the different practical examples. So it's like we uh, want to highlight that multi-sector response is key. It's not only that child protection actors can solve the multifaceted issue of child labor. We also need to focus on humanitarian crisis. We know it's International Year for Elimination of Child Labor and the Sustainable Development Goals, but it's a need to tackle uh, child labor in humanitarian crisis that is very interconnected with child labor. And also it's important to work together and take action. And an example of that is uh, today uh, having all of us in this launch and to be able to you not know, duplicate uh, and to joint efforts. So uh, Simon, tell us about the microsites. Uh, I'm putting the link in the chat. Sure. So this is the one place to go to access and download the toolkit and also other associated resources. So we've got the tools, the case studies, the two page summaries if you're short on time because it is a very dense uh, dense toolkit so you can look at quick two page summaries it also has key contacts and links for more information um, we're hoping that the translations and the training package will also be available um, in the not too distant future to assist with this and the training package is there again to help with those who really don't necessarily feel so confident on the topic of, of child labor to to have the confidence to engage and and know how to use the tools uh, effectively yeah the link has now been shared so please feel free to share widely amongst colleagues contacts anyone who who it may be of use to i mean the we've got 19 main tools within it and 34 case studies highlighting good practices um, and all of these can also be accessed through the microsite great thank you both very much that was wonderful i'm sure we'll have more questions as the session develops on the use of the toolkit and things that were in it. So we're now moving on to some country specific cases. The toolkit is based on the rich working experiences of many organizations and contains 34 case studies, some of which we're now going to hear about. Let me start with Molly Nabarembi, a programs officer at the Ecological Christian Organization and a passionate youth advocate from Uganda, who was herself formerly in child labor. Molly, how can the community, children, adolescents themselves be included in initiatives to prevent and respond to child labor? The floor is yours. And I also want to say that please do share with us some of your experiences in child labor. Molly, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris, uh, for this opportunity and uh, everybody that is joining this call for this very important cause. Uh, once again, my name is Molly Namirembe from Uganda. First of all, I speak from a, a, a very uh, personal experience because I went through this when I was at the age of 11 after the death of my parents. And uh, it was just me and my sister left to take care of ourselves. So I know what this means. I have worked on an empty stomach before for long hours, picking tea. And uh, yeah, I know it's not nice to go through and I don't wish it for anyone else. Uh, moving to the question of uh, how can we be able to engage communities and children? I strongly feel that for us to effectively involve the communities and children, we need to understand them first of all. We need to understand them and their dynamics, where they come from, the available resources that they have, uh, the gender, the cultural perspectives, the norms and practices in that particular community. Because these come into very great play uh, when it comes to uh, exposing children to child labor, also eradicating it. And after understanding what our communities are like and all the extra dynamics, we need to let them know and make them aware about the dangers of child labor. Because I have worked in communities where it is very hard to draw a line between uh, between child labor and light work that children should do for them to be able uh, to grow up as responsible citizens. So it's very important that we give them the right information and I've seen that the toolkit has all that information. It's very nice that we let them know and we let them be aware and uh, they can be able to appreciate the magnitude of this problem. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we need to involve the communities right from the planning of the projects and program design. Many times we come back to our communities uh, at a stage where we are implementing or we need their input 
uh, rather than when, when we are developing the proposals, when we are developing the programs as government, when we are developing the programs as the global actors. So it's very important that we consult them right from the start and we get to know and hear them. What do they want? Many times programs are designed and uh, brought back to the communities, but the communities do not embrace them because they are not actually providing what they need. It is very important that these communities become organized. Because uh, I work in a community where uh, there's a lot of artisanal mining going on. But because the communities are not organized, it's very hard for them to be able to hold other sectors accountable. So it's very important that we organize them to have a unified voice, speaking about the same thing and holding the same people accountable. And for the children, I strongly feel that, uh, of course, we have uh, a target to eliminate all child labor cases by 2025. And like everybody has mentioned, the pandemic is taking us miles back where we came from, uh, but we shouldn't lose hope. And for some of these children, we need to teach, them, to teach them to be resilient to the issues that are happening to their communities. I am a living example of resilience because I had no one to touch on, but I knew child labor was not for me. I knew there had to be something to work out given all the circumstances that I was going through. And this is what I keep sharing every day with the children. We need to look out for those positivities that are within our communities. It all can't be negative. And the children have to know and remain resilient to those negative things that affect them. And then uh, it's very important that we make the roles of the communities clear to them. Many times we tell them communities, children and people, you need to come in and support, but what should they do? It should be as clear as one, two, three. As communities, when you come together, you have to do A, B, C, and D. And I'm so happy to see the toolkit because it has roles, specific roles for everybody that's supposed to take or play a part in the elimination of child labor. And finally, as I go, it's very important while uh, involving communities to always give and take feedback from them. As we implement whatever projects that we are implementing, whatever programs that we are using to support the children, the adolescents, and the communities, we need to always keep checking, are we moving in the right direction? Are they on the same page with us? Are they appreciating what we are doing with them? Do they feel it's something that is going to help them? And at the same time, when they go and you know demand for accountability somewhere, we take them for these very good activities. Are we able to give them feedback? What has come out of their actions as communities? Because at times they cannot come to be on such a global platform like we are having today. But do we go back to give them a feedback that whatever you did in the last year 2020 has resulted into this at the global level? So it's very important to give and take feedback uh, to the communities and young people. And this keeps motivating them to go on, but it also makes our programs and implementation even better. Otherwise, thank you. Back to you, Chris. Molly, thank you so much. That was a really, really rich presentation, raising lots of questions, and I'm sure we will come back to you later in the Q&A session. So if you have any questions for Molly, her work or her life in child labour, do send them in. Next to Elizabeth Marti from Terre des Hommes. Elizabeth has been working in the humanitarian field for over 15 years and for almost 10 years in general protection and coordination in Car, the Car, Mali, Ivory Coast, and now in Burkina Faso with several international NGOs. Since 2020, Elizabeth is the Protection Programme Coordinator at Terre des Hommes in Burkina Faso, with a focus on the protection of children in mobility or migration and on the protection of children in conflict with the law. Elizabeth, what positive and innovative examples have you seen of addressing child labour for adolescent girls in Burkina Faso? Over to you. So many young girls in Burkina Faso leave their village for the big cities in search of work. But this is not a new phenomenon, but the girls are taking a lot of risks by moving alone to the big cities. This is why the people from the different areas where these girls come from have set up a network to put them a minimum of protection. So I'm just going to talk to you about the case of young domestic girls and give you the example of the big 
I'm afraid we're going to have to interrupt who you. Who provides support? Who best job in center called Point? We're mm -hmm. having problems with your voice. I think if um, myself and Sylvia um, and mm -hmm. others turn off our cameras, it might make it easier. So back, back to you, Elizabeth. Okay, so I was saying that I'm just going to talk to you about the case of young domestic girls and give you the example of the big sisters and school-based drop-in center called Point Espoir. So the big sisters are those who provide support and mentoring to the young girls as soon as they arrive in the big sisters. So who are the big sisters? The big sisters are former domestic workers who themselves left their villages to work in the big cities and stayed. They are the ones who will welcome the young girls who already have their contact when they leave their village because they belong to the same community. They will be able to advise and guide the girl in her first experience of working as a domestic. They sometimes act as mediators in case of conflict between the employer and the young domestic worker. They can refer cases of young domestic workers, violence or abuse to social workers if, if necessary, as they know the protection actors that can provide appropriate responses to the needs of young domestic victims. The big sisters are not organized into an association here, but they are all members of associations and are aware of a number of issues relating to children's rights and the risk of abuse and exploitation to which young domestic workers may be subjected. In case of emergency assistance needs, the big sister will refer the case to the social worker of TDH who can either respond directly to the needs of the young girl or accompany the social worker of the Ministry of Social Action to respond to it. Big sisters have the addresses of employers of girl domestics and Terdezon relies on these big sisters to mobilize young domestic workers when an activity is planned for them. And this brings me to the point espoir, which all the big sisters know about, because they are the ones who support Terre des Hommes in mobilizing the girls on the day that an activity is planned in a point espoir. So the point espoir, an innovative example of Terre des Hommes to protect young domestic girls. The point espoir are usually located in neighborhoods where there is a significant concentration of the community to which the girls belong. They are located because they are easy to find. And these points espoir are always run by a social worker from the Ministry of Social Action and a community worker who may be a big sister. The Point Espoir are, plain, are places where young domestic workers can meet with members of the same community. It is a place of exchange and sharing. Young domestic girls have also the opportunity to share their difficulties and problems and to get advice and support from other young domestic like themselves, if needed, or from the social workers. Awareness rising sessions are also organized on different themes that the young domestics can also choose. And terrorism also asks external institu institutional actors. It could be the uh, police commissioner and the children's judge to come and raise awareness on the risk of children, children on the move or on children's, or on children's rights. Sometimes, on the request of the girls also, small training courses are also organized to empower young female domestic workers, for example, in, some, in soap making or tomato puree, as shown in the photo. And finally, the afternoon at the Point Espoir is ended with a meal served to all those present. Thank you very much now.
Over to you, Chris. Thank you very, very much indeed. I'd like now um, to talk a little bit about the social media involvement that we are hoping from you. You saw the video earlier. We're asking you to promote the hashtag NChildLabor2021 on your social media platforms in support of the International Year of the Elimination of Child Labor. Our hope is that a global conversation is going to be energized as a result of this launch event, and we're relying on you to make that happen. I'd like now to hand over to Sarah Lim from the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action to show you some of the online promotion you've been doing around this launch and to inspire you to do more. So Sarah, over to you, please. Thank you, Chris. We'd like to encourage all of you to go to your social media platform of choice right now, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and share a key message or takeaway from this virtual launch using the hashtag and end child labor 2021. This will be our collective message to the world. And so right now we're showing you on the screen messages that uh, have been sent out with the hashtag and child labor 2021 on Facebook. And also if we can look at the ones on Twitter Wonderful, we see that there is a screenshot of the global virtual launch. And then also on LinkedIn. And we hope that you can join this um, critical conversation on your platforms. And especially in terms of promoting this key message that a multi-sectoral res response is key in terms of ending child labor. Thank you, back to you, Chris. That's great. Thank you very, very much indeed. We are hoping to go to Zainab in Beirut and we'll see if we can get her on the line. But um, while we do that, I'd like now to move on to the question and answer session. We have 20, 25 minutes to um, take some of the questions. Um, let me uh, kick off by asking um, some of our, our case study, Molly in particular, um, how is it going to change the way you work? Um, what might you have done differently in the past that you're now going to change as a result of this toolkit? Molly, please. I think, first of all, I want to appreciate the work done in the toolkit. It's very uh, comprehensive and uh, yet precise. And uh, while going through the toolkit, I think one of the, uh, the, the, the tools that is going to impact on the work that I do every day is the toolkit on the, uh, the case workers kit. Uh, these are cases that I deal with every day, but I, the, the, oftentimes there are those small, small steps that I have been missing out. For example, uh, I looked at uh, the case management where there is a, a case to do with referrals, and I've realized there are so many times when we are budgeting and we do not think about the emergencies that come as a result of referrals. So I think for me, this case workers tool is, is a guide that I take on with myself, and I think it's, it's going to impact more of how I do effective referrals, because do, do, while doing the work of elimination of child labor, you cannot work alone, you cannot work in isolation from the rest. So I take on that I have to um, consider effective referrals right from the time of budgeting, uh, look at what kind of emergence can come up. When referring someone, you should be able to follow them until the, the very last you know, step of the referrals. I think I take this up, but I also picked interest in the one that says, uh, children are not little adults. Children have their voices, they have ideas, they have opinions, they have dreams. They are not little, little adults, they are just children and they must be given the platform to express themselves. So for me, I think my work is going to change uh, comprehensively, right from proposal development, when I, I make sure I include all the activities as stipulated by the toolkit. So it's a job well done. Molly, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we can now go to Zainab Hussain, our third 
case study. Uh, Zainab is with International Rescue Committee. She has been working in the humanitarian protection field for 12 years. She started her career as a social worker with local and international organizations and worked later as protection manager with various UN agencies. In 2020, Zainab joined IRC as a national child protection coordinator overseeing child protection in emergencies. Zainab, welcome. Why should we prioritize child labor when engaging in child protection or when engaging in child protection or other humanitarian inventions, interventions in sectors such as education and health. So why should we address child labor when we're looking at these other sectors, please? Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon to all participants. First, child labor is a humanitarian, socioeconomic, and a political cross-cutting issue in terms of both driving crisis and also the harmful consequences. Therefore, an effective practice to uh, address child labor and its long-term impacts requires a complementarity and multi-sectoral approach and strategy. First, to affirm and confirm on the responsibility and accountability of each sector against the affected children and mainstreaming child labor throughout the program cycles for every sector. And to address the, to address the different aspects of child labor in, uh, in, in emergencies and humanitarian settings and to ensuring a quality response and reach out to a better and sustainable outcomes. The protracted nature of the multifaceted crisis that Lebanon is facing and that started with the Syrian influx to Lebanon in 2011, in addition to the economic crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic and the Beirut blast, weakened the already fragile infrastructures and deepened the existing vulnerabilities. It reduced the vulnerable population access to livelihood and food security and resulted in the prevalence of negative coping mechanism and increased the risk of violence and exploitation against children. Children engaged in child labor as a negative coping mechanism doubled, from, doubled to 4.4% comparing to 2020. 67% of children reported increasingly becoming the uh, solo breadwinner in their, in their households after the pandemic and the percentage was 40% before the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic in 2019. In a country with a poor socioeconomic and living conditions and where the child protection system is constrained in terms of resources and capacity, the child protection sector, along with other sectors such as education, protection, livelihoods, basic assistance, have a crucial role to play in addressing child labor. That's why IRC adopted the multi-sectoral uh, approach. The uh, IRC started the Child Street and Working Children program in Lebanon in 2013, targeting children who are engaged in worst form of child labor, including children who are working on the streets and providing a, a comprehensive package of service, such as the case management and safety mapping, emergency cash fund, community-based and focused PSS, awareness and risk mitigation, parenting sessions for caregivers, basic literacy and numeracy referrals to other sectors, legal assistance and representation and livelihood activities and interventions for working children and for their caregivers. In addition, IRC is working with the employers, negotiating with employers to enhance the working and safety conditions in relation to working hours, breaks, access to education and PSS activities and providing a tailored workplace toolkit to ensure the safety of children in hazards work. IRC is work working also through local partners to enhance the ownership and ensure the sustainability of the multi-sectoral approach in addressing child labor and providing its services through mobile safe spaces and uh, static safe healing and learning spaces. In addition, IRC is uh, working on capacity building for the actors uh, and uh, joint, joint advocacy. And here IRC is providing trainings for child protection and non-child protection actors as part of child protection mainstreaming in other sectors. And here where we see that this toolkit serves as a very informative, useful, and comprehensive resource that IRC can add to its capacity building package and technical <coughs> resources. As impact of this multi-sectoral approach, IRC notes that 
children are increasing uh, sense of safety and mitigating the risk of exploitation and abuse. They change the type, the type of work. So some children moved from hazardous and worst form of child labor to light work. Children increased access to decent work and they are working in less exploitative conditions. Children are enrolled in formal education. Caregivers increased access to labor market and livelihoods. And this also decreased their reliance on children income as a negative coping mechanism and led to withdrawing children completely from the work. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Zainab. I'm glad we were able to get hold of you. And we can now return to our question and answer session. We've got a question from Dan Owen of the World Bank. Dan says, and I say, he says, thank you all for your presentations. Could you perhaps elaborate on how different types of agencies at different levels, local, regional, national, international, civil society, private sector, government, donor, international agencies, international financial institutions, such as the World Bank, big breath, um, might best contribute to the overall goals as expressed. And Dan says, stronger pivot to prevention, holistic approaches, emphasis on child protection. Um, Audrey, can I bring you in to have a go at that one? And I'll bring in others who may want to speak. So Audrey, over to you, please. I think what is important is really to look at the resources available at the different level. And um, one of the one of the strengths I, I am seeing is that we have, and especially since the, the COVID-19, we have seen as well that we have a lot of national organization working at field level. Um, and we need to find a way to better support them if this is answering the question. Um, and, and also really the interagency collaboration. That's great. Thank you. Dan, I mean, if you want to come back, please just um, put something um, in the chat. We also have a question from Mijanur Rahman from um, Educo in Bangladesh. Um, he is basically saying that um, long term projects are required to eliminate child labor, but most of the donors, he says, give support uh, mainly for short term projects. I'm not sure if that's specifically in Bangladesh. Um, question, how can it be possible in this situation to eliminate child labor, which is a, a, a long-term issue? Can I give that to either Sylvia or to Simon? Yes, thank you, Chris, and thank you very much for the question. And actually, uh, this reminds me like the, um, the toolkit, it has like a humanitarian approach, but also it, it promotes a collaboration with uh, development colleagues and others working in the preparedness phases and the recovery phases. And it's very important to foster that collaboration. And some of the actions included in the toolkit as well for resource mobilization is how we can also add some of the actions in uh, existing strategies in humanitarian overall strategies, but also how we can use the evidence, how we can use the evidence to demonstrate and, you know, to advocate. Uh, and then so there are several, you know, several information in the toolkit uh, to use the evidence and, you know, see how we can mobilize more resources from donors. Uh, but definitely it's actually a, a challenge on how we can better work together uh, with development colleagues looking at more like long term um, interventions where we have more like short and medium term uh, interventions. And I don't know if like Simon, you want to add also on your side. Sure. It, it also de depends greatly on, on the context of, of the event. I mean, humanitarian action crisis, we've seen cro mm. COVID can crop up in many different ways. There's also a different way of, say, if there's a typhoon, hurricane or tsunami, which has a very limited impact in a concentrated area and possibly is seen as a acute disaster as opposed to a chronic situation where you say in Syria, where we've had 10 years of the same situation. The way you can respond, the way you can engage with government institutions is very different. And I think as well, the humanitarian actors, especially if they're used to dealing with acute crises, don't necessarily have the same connections or, or contacts within, say, government, the Ministry of Labour or others who, who deal regularly on child labour and see how they can work complementarily. Um, Whereas in other situations where there's conflict, uh, the government is part of the, the armed conflict or the state has been eroded by many years of conflict, uh, underfunding, et cetera, there may not be the capacity there. So it's, it's hard to necessarily have a one size fits all solution. However, there's a lot that can be brought from both approaches. 
Simon, thank you very much. Your mention of governments actually segues nicely to a question from Pedro Perez, who is with Plan International in Nicaragua. Um, he asks, what recommendations do you have to influence governments to implement this tool, this, this toolkit? Um, Francesca, would you like to take that one? He's, Pedro Perez is saying, is asking, what recommendations do you have to influence governments to use and to implement the, the toolkit? Over to you, Francesco. I think Francesco may have gone, so I'm quite happy to take it on his behalf. I mean, with the ILO, we have the mechanisms as a tripartite uh, mechanism and, and using Ministry of Labour as our entry point to discuss issues around that and looking at how to support. But it, there are a lot of ways to influence government. But um, as we've seen, uh, Francesco mentioned that in 2020, Convention 182 of the ILO on the worst forms of child labour was ratified by every single member state uh, of the ILO and the first convention to ever be universally ratified, which shows that there is a will and that governments are interested and see that the elimination of child labour is something important to do. So using points like that, this is an entry point where we say, look, we've already committed to the worst forms of child labour and how to eliminate them. What can we do to put more pressure on? What's needed in terms of policy and quite often it's not a policy issue, it's about the enactment of policy on the ground, which is why crisis and conflict situations are even more important because you have the breakdown of that government, you have the breakdown of the institutions. Can I just ask you quickly, Simon, um, Dan Owen from the World Bank has come back to said, he said, what I'm trying to get at is how to try and mobilize for effective systemic change, not just silo approaches with good individual projects sponsored by separate agencies. What sort of messages about where and how best to cooperate across agencies, that cross sectoral approach that we were talking about earlier? Sylvia or Simon, one of you, please. Um, maybe I can quickly mention about uh, coordination. I think like, you know, as part of the, our part, like the second part in the toolkit actually covers quality child labor response. And one of the quality, you know, the, one of the quality response is based on coordination. So we have different examples of coordination, sometimes led by uh, one sector, sometimes led by a multi-sectoral, like the case of uh, Turkey, and one like sometimes led by government. So I think like the key entry point for also uh, multi-sectoral assessment, multi-sectoral uh, design strategies, uh, monitoring, etc., is to have a coordination mechanism. And the toolkit actually has some actions to get to the coordination, but also has some examples, uh, very like positive examples and successes from different examples from Middle East, for example. Uh, so I think like that can also help to answer the question from Dan and also for Nicaragua in terms of like engaging government. I think that's a very uh, a starting point from NGO and civil society and how we can work together. Uh, we have a question from Amy Fisher, um, who is asking about children with disability. How does the toolkit address children in child labor who have issues with disability? No, thank you, Amy. I'm going to post, uh, there's actually, the toolkit has different tools, and one of the tools is actually looking at how to engage uh, children with disabilities, uh, and has a very, like, a specific actions and things, like, within our specific uh, work in different sectors can have a special attention and do like a tailored intervention for children with disabilities. We know that this is, um, you know, it's an issue on inclusiveness and we've tried to add it uh, throughout the toolkit, but also highlighting a specific tool that can help uh, practitioners to look at children with disabilities when working uh, with children in child labor. And I'm going to post it on the chat box. We've got a question from Nusrat Bashir Zafar Nusrat. Um, I'm not sure where you are, but it's a very broad question. I'd like to give it um, to, to Molly, if you don't mind, something from the field. What is the main reason for child labour? It's a very basic and very good and very fundamental question. But Molly, from your perspective and with yeah. all of your experience, what causes child labour? I guess the biggest cause of child labour, especially in the communities where I work, is poverty. And uh, we have, uh, it's very few children from very good households that are being exploited in child labor. 
What actually the well-to-do households are doing is they are the ones that are exploiting those that are living in poverty. So for me, I would link the biggest cause of child labor to poverty. However, uh, poverty is also facilitated by weak enforcement of laws because there are communities that know child labor is bad, but because there is nobody to enforce, you know the law against it, it, it keeps on prevailing and prevailing. So many uh, other children are also in child labor because of lack of uh, quality basic services in most communities. Of course, it's also interlinked with poverty, but you find communities where there are no schools leaving the children, you know, to be at home redundant. And I've seen this also in the toolkit that children who are out of school are actually at a very great risk. And I've seen also this happen in community. You find children who cannot be able to access, uh, you know, free medical care, being forced to go and work. Many children, even on social media, are working to ensure that they provide health services for their mothers, grandparents, and whoever they care about. So I think everything revolves around poverty, but also a weak enforcement of laws, as well as limited access to basic quality, you know, quality basic care, including education and health. Yeah. Molly, thank you very much. Another question for you, if you don't mind, it's from Jacinta yeah. Mwinzi. Mm. Jacinta, I'm not exactly sure where you are, um, but you, you're, you're asking about the family. Um, you're mm. saying that, you know, often it's poverty, as mm. Molly's just been saying, that drives children um, into child labour or forces them to a question of adequate resources. What can be done to uplift the family income? You know, we've heard about preventative measures, but... Um, Molly, talk to me about the family and empowering families uh, mm. to make sure their children are not forced into child labor. I think uh, for us to address the issue of poverty, one, we must look at family uh, livelihood, as you have said. And uh, in my country where I come from, it's very important to support communities and families to be able to take part in agriculture because we have the market for food. Uh, we have markets like even outside our country, but it's because communities are not able to take part in agriculture. So there is very, very important, there is very, very great need for us to support uh, households to be able to improve their own livelihoods in terms of income generating activities. And we have seen this work in the agriculture sector, but also we believe that uh, as, as families try to, you know, provide other, other basic needs, there is need for government to come and wave off some of the expenses that families have. For example, if government waved, waved off the expense on education in my country, the expense on health, so many children would not be working because some of them are able to provide the best food. But what about, it's not just about food to eat. There are so many other things around. So I think government should also be able to wave off some of those so that uh, families can be able to participate. Molly, Molly. And also, uh, just, just one last one. Uh, also, in terms of improving a uh, uh, family, you know, welfare and being able to, to support their own children, I think there is need for us to hold private sector accountable. Why I, I mentioned this as a key factor in the communities where I work, especially in Karamoja, you can read about Karamoja in Uganda. It's one of the communities that has very many resources, including gold, including marble, including like, you know, all the limestone, whatever you can think about. But the families remain poor simply because the private sector come extract the materials and take them out. They never pay royalties back to the communities, even when our national law says that 3% uh, of the royalties the profits from those minerals are supposed to be given back. They don't. We have been working with communities, and so far, all the time I've worked in this in this you know sector, I have seen one company that we held accountable by organizing community members, and they actually stopped work from going on at the factory, and that's when they were able to pay you know back their royalties. And these royalties were able to support over 15 children that we had withdrawn from child labor to go back to school. Now they are, they are you know, pursuing their dreams. So I think as much as we look at families, we need to look at private sector being able to pay back where they plow all the profits from. Wow, good. Thank you. Here, here. Um, can I, Simon, did you- Yeah, no, I just wanted to jump in on that. I agree with much of what Molly says, but it also reinforces the point, especially around livelihoods in terms of decent work and making sure that people earn and get a fair wage and decent working conditions and if parents are earning enough and as I say the imposition of school costs etc then children are better protected 
Uh, and so this, this links in on the livelihood side, on the education side, again, being able to provide there. The protection side, you also have social protection, safety nets, et cetera. Now, in an emergency setting, these things are, are less, but then there's ways of providing them and ensuring that livelihoods and opportunities are not exploitative. Because if the adults are exploited, then the children are also likely to be exploited. So, so it's just Thank basically you. reinforcing what Molly's saying. Thank, good point. Thank you very much, Simon. I'd like to get some of the perspectives from Zainab and Elizabeth um, on the family and family um, welfare. Um, Elizabeth, you, you heard what Molly said. From your perspective in Burkina Faso, what more can be done to empower families, to work with us, to use this toolkit in a way to stamp out child labour? Elizabeth. I think the most important thing working with family is to uh, raise awareness on their responsibility regarding the, their children. And uh, because we, we also found a lot of negligence in the education of the children. I agree with Molly when she's saying that the most, the, the most important reason that push children uh, to try to find a work is uh, the poverty. But I also think that the lack of education is also one of the reasons. I mean, the, the lack of education uh, on the side of the parents, because um, sometimes, sometimes they push children to go and work, you know, uh, while the, why they, they don't really need the children to work. Uh, so it's uh, sometimes there is no choice for the family, but sometimes they have choice, but they, they, they just don't care. So um, awareness and uh, towards this awareness rising towards the, the family is very, something very important. Yes. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And, um, and Zeynab, over to you in um, Beirut. We heard uh, Molly talk earlier about business and the involvement of business. We've also got a question actually from Yvonne Pasquale, um, who says, how do you engage the right people in providing answers, perhaps business. Um, Zainab, what do you say to her? A, uh, this general point about the family, but also about engaging business and engaging the right people. Over to you, Zainab. Uh, thank you, Chris. First, it's uh, very important to consult with caregivers, with business owners, with, with those who are influencing, uh, influencing the market to labor in Lebanon to understand like the problem from the different perspective. What's the position of the caregivers who are pushing their children? What are the main reasons? What are the main driving factors in terms also like of business? What's offered to caregivers? Is it tailored to their uh, capacities, educational background, etc.? How can how flexible they are to uh, to host like non-skilled labor like in in their in their domain and how how strong they act in terms of protecting children second is like the participatory approach throughout the program cycle design like uh, when when we design the program we should consult with everyone caregivers business owners etc we see how we can influence everyone through specific activities and also like engaging caregivers, not only to withdraw children from the market and the labor, but also to encourage them to keep their eye open about the child working conditions, knowing the employer where the child work to minimize or to mitigate the risk of exploitation and abuse that the children can uh, can uh, mitigate to. Another thing is like the strong, uh, sec that strong coordination with the livelihood sector who is supporting the business projects and the, the, the business owners to develop their own projects. So to, to, to focus on caregivers of children uh, who are engaged in labor to support them, whether through engaging in livelihood activities or whether through uh, like small grants to support their uh, bus uh, business or like income generation uh, in, small, in small projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, that's really, really interesting. I've got two related questions, slightly technical, and maybe um, for Sylvia and um, for Simon. One was about cash generation, um, and the other is what does the toolkit prioritise? What, what does the toolkit have to say um, about, about cash support programmes and how they're used to eliminate child labour? Uh, over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Chris. So interventions on cash are included as part of food security and livelihoods. And what the toolkit has to say is looking at 
risks and protective factors. So it's looking at how um, we can integrate child labor in the existing food security and livelihoods. So seeing how we can uh, be, you know, the targets uh, of like you know, at-risk children or children engaged in child labor or their families so we can support and strengthening those protective factors, but also mitigate those risks. So we have some examples actually of using cash programming in, you know, in Syria crisis, in Turkey and also in Egypt uh, to support education and to support also strengthening families so that that doesn't become like a negative copy mechanism for children to engage in child labor. So that's the um, approach that the toolkit takes and has several examples. Sure. I think I'd just say those questions were from Hanedi, Hanadi al Karyuti and Onesmo Lamek about, about cash interventions. We've also got a question from Abun Adeshulo Kazim. It's a very general question. What are the best processes of supporting vulnerable children in the community? It's a very general question, but um, Simon, perhaps, what does the toolkit have to say about supporting the most vulnerable? We do talk about targeting within the um, toolkit, and this is important for all of it. And, and the other thing which is at the heart of both humanitarian work and child protection and child labour is the do no harm principle. So first of all, we're looking to ensure that the actions which are taken do not increase harm that happens. But the targeting of who to target is extremely important and then how to help them to reduce their vulnerability because it's not always easy, especially when you're dealing with worse forms of child labour. As you can imagine, some of that may involve um, in emergency settings, children involved in armed conflict um, and put it high risk however removing them straight away may put themselves and their families at greater risk so there's there's a great amount of sensitivity which needs to be done both in terms of the targeting and the intervention um, and the toolkit does go into some of that great i'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the q and a session thank you for so many um very rich and very interesting questions but we need now to move on to the child labor pledge um, and our concluding thoughts and actions as part of the international year on ending child labor we are all being asked to submit pledges to perform specific actions that will lead to the ending of child labor it's time to accelerate the pace of progress to inspire policy and to find practical actions and to eliminate child labor for good i want to give the floor to the child labor task force to share its pledge to be clear a pledge is a promise and a plan to take concrete action in 2021 to end child labor by 2025 um, i come back to simon and sylvia i know you've spoken a lot today you two um, but tell us more about shifting from commitment to action over to you Thank you, Chris. So I'm speaking on behalf of the Child Labor Task Force and all their members. So we want to seize the opportunity of the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labor and use this global virtual launch to share our promise, our commitment, and submit the pledge for 2021. So our pledge, as it reads in the slide, is that the interagency toolkit, preventing and responding to child labor in humanitarian action, is available and disseminated at local, national, regional, and global levels, but also that humanitarian responders have enhanced knowledge and competencies to prevent and respond to child labor in humanitarian action. So in the coming months, we'll be working with all the different child labor task force members, but also all of you attending today and who are interested uh, in disseminating at various levels. And to do so, what we are doing is translating into different languages, and we are developing a specific regional toolkit for the Middle East and for Latin America to make sure are very adapted to the legal frameworks to those regions, and also identifying platforms and materials to reach a very vast audience. So we will really count on you to make this uh, pledge come to Rio. And secondly, we'll make available a training package. So I know like some of you have been asking about capacities and technical support. So we'll make available training package and technical support to enhance the competencies and knowledge. 
through videos, self-taught models, and also ready packages to be facilitated to accompany this toolkit. So this is our commitment, but we also want to encourage all of you. Uh, the pledges can be submitted at individual level, government, organizational level. So tomorrow there will be some Q&A sessions uh, organized by the Alliance 8.7. So we will invite all of you to join those Q&A sessions. So we will share more information in the chat as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Simon, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I'm just uh, adding the links for the registration for the Alliance 8.7 information sessions on these action pledges. So if you're interested in finding out more about these, they will be held tomorrow at 10.30 till 12 uh, Central European time and 4 p.m. till 5.30 Central European time. The first link I've shared is for the morning session and the second one is for the afternoon. But if you look through the Alliance 8.7 website, you should also find out this information. Um, Wonderful. So hopefully you can also uh, pledge along with us. Thank you so much. Let's hope people follow up. And thanks for posting those links. Thanks to Simon and Olivia. And there, I'm afraid we have to end. I hope we've achieved what the organizers set out for us and that we all have a clear idea of what a powerful instrument the toolkit is. We need to move forward with the energy and commitment that we've all felt today and make it our mission to motivate the communities around us, local and global. The ultimate objection is to do just what the hashtag says, to end child labor. It's ambitious, but together it can be done. Together we can transform the lives of tens of millions of children around the world. And on that note of ambition and optimism, I'd like to thank all our inspirational speakers and thanks also to all our participants. From us at the Alliance, thank you and